eventually as you get more involved with forecasting, there's going to come a point where you're going to have to learn how to work with soundings to develop a forecast. And what we'll see a whole lot more of in the 2020s is the use of Sharpie, the sounding and hodograph analysis research program for Python. And that's very important because Python allows for open source software development. Anyone who uses it can actually review the code and see how the algorithms, measures, conversions, and so on are being done. And that's very important for an open source approach, which is pretty much mandatory in the academic, government, and research community. Sharpie is produced by Kelton T. Halbert of OU, W. Gregory Bloomberg of SIMS, and Patrick T. Marsh of the Storm Prediction Center. Now, Sharpie does exist as source code as well as standalone binaries, but it's vastly more likely you're going to be using it online with providers that have implemented it, such as Pivotal Weather, as seen here, where you just click on a weather map and it brings up a sounding. Now, there are a few different sources of data, and it's important to be aware of them. One source is observed data that comes directly from radio sounds. We receive it as upper air code, and we're basically showing what the radio sound detected. Now, another source is model-derived soundings. And that's where we take the GFS, the NAM, high resolution rapid refresh, any of those models, and we interpolate the data in that model volume. And that's what we see a lot on the internet on sites like Pivotal Weather. Now, another source is satellite derived soundings, which is getting a little bit more into the experimental area. I don't know of any sites that use Sharpie that have those, but we may see some in the near future. Now, for observed soundings, the one I'm most familiar with is the Storm Prediction Center sounding page. And to get there, it's pretty straightforward. Just go to Forecast Tools and Observe Sounding. You can see that the newest data is at the top of the screen. These are all stations that have taken special soundings, but the nearest synoptic time is going to be down here at 12Z. And you can see that that gives us Sharpie output generated by SPC. And the concepts that we're going to go over are pretty much all the same. And another source of observed data is running Sharpie directly. For model-derived soundings, we just go to a site like Pivotal Weather and click on the map. And many of them will have the forecast sounding pop up. And the layout is definitely recognizable as Sharpie. Now you need to be aware of the problem of convective contamination and unrepresentative parcels. And that usually happens when you're evaluating a parcel that's in the middle of a rain cloud or a thunderstorm. And it's not representative uh, at all of what's happening in the environment. Now here's an example. I'm going to pull up a sounding in the middle of this storm right here. And you'll notice that we get crazy vertical motions. That should be a red flag right there that you're sampling a convective cloud. So a lot of this boils down to not only looking for problems on the skew t but also being aware of your environment, doing the analysis, and knowing what's happening out there. And when we work with model data, we try to sample the inflow ahead of the storm rather than sampling the storm itself. Of course, your time is valuable. You may not want to watch the full 52 minutes, so feel free to skip ahead to a section that interests you. The SKU-T log P component, that's probably the main part of Sharpie there, most recognizable, and we find that at the top left. The job of the SKU-T is to answer how heat and moisture is distributed in the atmosphere. And so to understand that better, we're going to look at that storm situation that we've got going on in central Texas. So what do we got here? This is the SKU-T log P diagram. Keep in mind that up is going up into the vertical, tops out at 100 millibars, which is about 54,000 feet. 
and the bottom is near sea level. In moving from left to right, we get into warmer quantities in higher levels of moisture. Now, of course, the red line, that's the temperature line. So using the temperature line, we can pretty much identify what the temperature is at any given level. At 300 millibars, up at about 30,000 feet, the red line is found about right there. And we use that skewed, thus the name skew T, skewed temperature scale, and we read out a temperature of about 38 Celsius. The green line is dew point, and that's a measure of the absolute quantity of moisture in the atmosphere. Further it is to the right, the more moist it is at that level. So right here, very moist layer, dew points in the mid to upper 60s throughout the lowest mile or so of the atmosphere. Now in between, we've got this line that some of you may not be familiar with. That's the wet bulb temperature. And that always falls between temperature and dew point. And that's basically a measure of the amount of evaporation or cooling we would see in a parcel. We've got a couple of other quantities on here. We got this white line. That's a trace for the most unstable parcel. So that makes some assumptions about maximum temperature and a very warm contact layer near the ground and lifts the parcel until it reaches its LCL, lifted condensation level there, and then goes up wet adiabatically. So that's kind of a worst case scenario of what's going to happen in the atmosphere. There's also a dashed purple line way over here. That's the downdraft temperature trace. So that calculates about what the temperature of the downdraft is going to be in the mid-levels of the storm and brings it down moist adiabatically to the surface. So we have the wind barbs on the right side of the component. Those flags point into the wind. So these are all winds coming from the west and blow into the east. Each of these flags indicates 50 knots, and each of the long lines indicates 10 knots. And the small lines where you have them, those are 5 knots. So this example right here, that's indicating 70 knots at that level. Also, we have vertical velocity output over here. That comes only from model-derived data, if that's available. So where we have it red, that's indicating upward vertical motion. And where it's blue, you can see the magnitude lines point off to the left, and that's going to be downward motion. So that's an assumption of what the vertical velocities are at various levels. Omega is basically vertical velocity. And then we have this cyan band that might be new to some of you. That's the effective inflow layer and it has a top and a bottom. Typically we either take the surface parcel or we construct a parcel from the mixed layer in the lowest 100 millibars. This effective layer can be a lot more useful because it encapsulates a layer that has a certain amount of cape and convective inhibition. And we can assume that there's a good chance that entire layer will ascend into a rising updraft. And in many cases, especially in elevated storms, it can be better to use that, in, that effective inflow layer. In elevated situations, it's often better to use that effective layer. Surface layers will not rise up into an elevated situation. Mixed layers, same thing, and most unstable quantities may be unrepresentative. And that's pretty much all there is to it. There's just a couple of key levels. The level free convection, in this case it equals the LCL, lifted condensation level. LFC is, of course, where the rising updraft becomes buoyant and enters the free atmosphere. And then up here we have the equilibrium level, and that's where the rising parcel is in equilibrium in terms of energy with the air around it. So, and basically that's where the positive cape transitions over to negative cape, typically up near the stratosphere. And before we move on, of course I should point out these. It's a good idea to check those over, make sure you have the right information. This is showing it's a high resolution rapid refresh output on this date, 
for this time valid for one hour in the future from the model run and of course we also need to point out the scale down here at the bottom this is the temperature in Celsius on the left side that's the pressure in millibars which corresponds loosely to altitude and these lines sl sloping up into the right those are isotherms and these lines sloping up into the left are dry adiabats which represent potential temperature and then these green lines right here those are indicators of mixing ratio and that helps you calculate how much moisture the atmosphere can hold or how much moisture is actually present in it so you can take that green line reference it against the green lines and that gives you your mixing ratio referencing the temperature against those lines we get saturation mixing ratio and just by dividing mixing ratio by saturation mixing ratio that gives us our relative humidity so this value right here you can see at the surface we've got a mixing ratio of 14 grams per kilogram the saturation mixing ratio follow that up to green scale that's 28 grams per kilogram so 14 divided by 28 that gives you 0.5 so the relative humidity at the surface is 50 percent see that's not too bad all right let's move on now the wind profile I don't know if that deserves its own section but it is an important part of the chart and we find it in this vertical strip to the right of the skew T this component answers the question how wind velocity is distributed vertically and it also provides a color key for the rest of the chart so let's take a closer look we have this wind scale here this is every 10 knots so we go from zero on the left side to 70 on the right side and this is ground relative wind speed and the longer the bar the higher the wind speed at that level so obviously these winds are pretty strong now the other bit of information that's pretty important is the color key you notice how we have a red band we have a green band a yellow and a cyan the red layer indicates 0 through 3 kilometer winds that's about 0 through 10,000 feet green is 3 to 6 kilometers so that's about 10 to 20,000 feet roughly yellow brings us from 6 to 9 kilometers which is around 20 to about 30,000 feet and cyan from 9 to 15 kilometers which is uh, about 30,000 up to 45,000 feet and this is AGL above ground level and this color key is important because we reference it on other parts of the chart the hodograph the storm slinky this is all referenced to these colors so if you have any doubt reference that and then go back to the millibar and height scale next we have the temperature advection component and it's found just to the right of the wind profile and the purpose of this diagram to find what altitudes we might have cold and warm advection taking place and this is heavily keyed to the veering and backing of the wind flow you can see here we've got veering with height the winds kind of rotate clockwise and that implies warm air advection and then we have backing above that you can see it transitions to a clockwise and then above that we have backing and that's where the wind direction seems to shift in a counterclockwise sense with height so there's an assumption here that the winds are in geostrophic balance and that in turn determines what kind of temperature advection may be occurring in the atmosphere so these are done in layers of 100 millibars and so this component is referred to as inferred temperature advection so the colors indicate the sign of the temperature advection that's going to be warm air advection the blue is cold air advection and the lengths of the bars from the center indicate the magnitude of that advection and these numbers those indicate the change in Celsius degrees or Kelvin per hour <music> 
So again, this is all inferred, it's all implied, assuming the winds in are in geostrophic balance, which they're often not. However, you may find this of some use. And this is my favorite part of the package, the hodograph, because it has so much useful information. I'm probably not going to do a tutorial on hodographs. You can probably find other videos on YouTube or with a web search. But this is basically a plot of the winds with height. And the center of the diagram is the ground, so it's basically plotting ground relative winds. But you can easily use this diagram to shift coordinates and look at things from a storm relative perspective. And that's often what we use it for. So the most important thing, of course, is the wind profile. And that's it right there. That goes from the surface on up to the stratosphere. And yeah, remember our color keys. Red, that layer right there. Green, and so on. So we can see that this is the low levels and we can actually look at those numbers in the center of the dots to give us our height in kilometers which is incredibly essential there are a lot of uh, photographs out there in journals from especially from years ago where they don't calibrate the wind plot with any kind of height information it makes it useless okay what we see here is a curved photograph and especially in the lowest one to two to three kilometers curvature is important because that's what helps provide an environment that converts streamwise vorticity into storm rotation now there are a couple of quantities on here that we need to look at besides the wind profile we've also got the storm motion estimates using the bunkers method and those are in white the right motion vector right there and you can see the RM and we got the left motion vector which is LM so two different vectors and you can see it conveniently plots out our motion there storms coming from 295 at 17 knots the right movers so you just flip that 180 and that gives you motion towards 115 at 17 knots which is east southeast if you're expecting splitting storms that left motion vector comes in handy. Also, we've got a brown square. That's going to be the mean wind in the cloud layer between the LCL and the EL. And that's a good estimate of motion for young storms, storms that first develop. Their motion is going to fall somewhere in here, maybe out towards between the bunkers LM and RM motion. So we can see initially our storms will probably be moving quickly to the east at 30 to 35 knots. Then they'll slow down and the right movers will be moving to the southeast at 15 knots. Now what we also see is this cyan band right there that indicates the effective inflow layer top and bottom. And that's used to compute effective SRH. The wider that you get that area swept out in there, the greater your helicity and the better potential for rotating storms. And you notice that we key that off of the bunker's right motion estimate because we assume the right movers are what produce tornadoes. So we've got decent SRH in here and we'll be able to see that later on the shear totals. Effective inflow SRH 145 there, that's pretty decent. Now we've also got the Corfidi vectors. That's an estimate of MCS motion, depending on which way they propagate. With this Corfidi vector, we have an upshear vector, which is for back building storms. The storm inflow is subtracted from the mean wind. And we also have downshear for forward propagating storms where the storm inflow is added to the mean wind to give us our MCS motion. So rapidly gusting out storms that are rapidly advancing forward, they'll tend to move with this vector right here. It gives you a motion of 80 knots, assuming that actually happened. 
We also have critical angle. We don't see that very well because it there's hardly any zero through one kilometer shear. Here's a good example of critical angle. It's kind of hard to see it, but that purple line is right in there. And you can see that it's got a angle of about like that. Now that's not really perpendicular to the motion vector. It kind of shows an angle there. And that gives us kind of a diagonal critical angle. We want to see that line more like this at a 90 degree angle from the zero through 0 0.5 kilometer layer. And that's going to be a lot more efficient at converting the streamwise vorticity over to storm rotation. So we're usually looking for a critical angle of about 90 degrees or as close as we can get to that. And then we can use that diagram to eyeball some other quantities. See there's the 9 through 15 kilometer layer and we can see that there's good separation between the storm motion vector and that layer. And that indicates very good anvil level storm relative shear. And the length of the photograph, for example, from zero through six kilometers, that's a measure of bulk shear. The longer that line, the larger the bulk shear. And we've got a couple of quantifications of that down near the bottom of the diagram that we'll go into in just a minute. So large amounts of bulk shear mean long-lived storms and good storm organization. High amounts of SRH, critical angles near 90 degrees. Curved photographs, that's favorable for tornadoes and supercells. And strong anvil level storm relative winds. That's going to govern the separation between the downdraft cascade and the updrafts. And your more severe storms, that's going to tell you whether you're in the HP range, the LP range, or somewhere in between. In other words, storms where the updraft is highly visible or where it's buried within a bear's cage and surrounded by rain and hail cores. And then we have the Storm Slinky. That's probably one of the most unique parts of the package. The purpose of a Storm Slinky, to find out how air parcels in a storm map draft will move horizontally with respect to the cloud base. That can give us a lot of information how the storm will be structured and how much tilt it will have in the vertical. Now the Storm Slinky is set up in a way where we're looking down on the storm from above it. And what we see here is a simulation of parcel trajectories between the LFC and the equilibrium level. And you can see that it's color banded, so that's very important to keep in mind. And the lowest levels will be at the center of the diagram. That's pretty much the cloud base near the LCL. Now the way this works is the algorithm gives parcels a nudge of about 5 meters per second, about 10 knots upward from the LFC, and lets buoyancy do all the rest. So it's rising all the way up to the EL. And what we see here is a diagram of which way those parcels go. So we can see in this example, there's an initial northwestward trajectory. That's assuming you're kind of floating along with the cloud base. So the parcels kind of depart to the northwest. And then as they get higher and higher, they start moving towards the northeast. And then they wrap around and they get blown to the southeast. So the path is kind of curved as it rises. And plotting this, we get kind of a kidney bean shape. And that's important because Kidney bean shapes are associated with those curved hodographs. And a lot of situations with rotating storms and tornadoes are associated with these kidney bean shapes. Now a couple of other important parameters. The white line right there, that's the storm motion direction. So the cell is going to be propagating towards the southeast. We also have a measure of tilt. This is with respect to the horizon. That's up in the top right. 90 degrees is straight up. So we can see that this tower is standing 
straight up and down. If we have lower numbers like 45 degrees, that would indicate a strongly sheared environment or weak instability. On the other hand, high numbers close to 90 indicate the storm is vertical, and that means either low shear or strong instability. The original one and only, over 250 million sold, each sold separately. Next up is the equivalent potential temperature profile. This is a vertical plot of thermodynamic energy in the atmosphere. This diagram tells us at a glance how energy is distributed in the vertical. And another important aspect to this is the higher the theta E, the more buoyant the parcel. So theta E gives us our parcel temperature if we released all the available latent heat back into it. To calculate the theta E on the diagram, it's pretty straightforward. We lift a parcel up from a pre-selected level like the surface. Parcel goes up to its LCL using the standard method. Then we go up moist adiabatically up to the very top of the diagram. Then we go down dry adiabatically to the surface. So an effect that adds latent heat to the parcel, all that's available all the way up to the top. We come back down to the surface and we've warmed the parcel back up to its original pressure. So we're seeing the combination there of sensible heat plus latent heat. So looking at that uh, profile, there it is right there in that second box underneath the hodograph, and this stretches from the surface up to about 500 millibars. So we see in the lower levels, very high theta E, so we know it's warm and moist there, and it's probably cold and dry up above that. So what does that tell us? It gives some information about potential instability. When there's dynamic forcing working on the atmosphere and we lift the atmosphere, if there's a strong decrease in equivalent potential temperature, we can release that potential instability and steepen the lapse rates further. So that would be a situation that destabilizes that layer. The theta E profile is also useful for forecasting microbursts and downbursts. Now typically we look a lot at that wet bulb profile between the temperature and dew point line, but equivalent potential temperature has been looked at for forecasting microbursts and downbursts. Typically we look for a large theta E difference, like 25 to 30 Kelvin between the surface and the mid-levels. So you can see here we've got about 325 versus 345 to 350, so that's almost to the criteria for strong downbursts but not quite. And then we look over here, and we do see the decay levels are moderate. Now our next miniature box is a really neat one. This is storm relative winds. All we're doing here is evaluating the environmental wind flow with respect to the storm not to the ground. To understand it, let's do this. Let's evaluate three layers in the atmosphere. The 0 through 2 kilometer layer, the 4 through 6 kilometer layer, and the 9 through 11 kilometer layer. So let's start out with a hodograph. There's 0 through 2. The 4 to 6 layer is going to be right there. And then the 9 through 11 kilometer layer, which is going to be right there. And then we evaluate each of those against the storm motion right there to determine the storm relative wind. Now we can see some good separation between the storm motion and the 0 through 2 kilometer layer. So we've got some decent. So the length of that line right there, that's about 25 knots. It's about that far, see that's 25 knots right there, so we can assume that our 
storm relative zero through two kilometer flow is about 25 knots coming out of the south there. Looking at the four through six kilometer layer, the line looks kind of like that. So again, it's about 25 knots. And then the nine through 11 kilometer layer, it's a little bit longer, runs about like that. So that's about the equivalent of maybe that line right there. So that's about 40 knots. So the lengths of those lines, that's what the storm relative wind box is solving for us. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so now we can understand the storm relative wind diagram. It's just taking the storm motion and finding the vector differences between the environmental wind around that storm motion vector. So we find that box right there. Let's take a look at that. Now on this diagram, the x-axis is wind speed. So we start with 0 knots, 10, 20, and go all the way up to 70 knots of storm relative wind. So we're looking strictly at magnitude here. The y-axis is altitude in kilometers above ground level. And that goes from zero at the ground up to 15 kilometers above ground level. So what we see here is a red trace indicating the storm relative wind speed. So we can see the storm relative winds peak right here at about 10, 20, 30, 40, about 45 knots. So that kind of helps us visualize that. And what's really helpful are these layer rep representations. Right here, that little bar that's red that I got circled, that's the zero through two kilometer layer wind. And by looking at it on the x-axis, that's about 28 knots of storm relative velocity. Zero through two kilometer wind is a measure of inflow. So this gives us 28 knots of storm relative inflow. That's a pretty good supply of fuel. Right here in the middle, we've got another bar that's colored light blue. That's the four through six kilometer storm relative wind. Now we've got 30 knots on that. A study by Thompson in 2003 showed that four through six kilometer winds above nine to 10 meters per second are favorable for rotating storms. And that corresponds to about 18 knots. Now looking over here on the left, we got this little dashed white line that is for 15 knots. So if we're a little bit above that, that indicates that we're in that favorable range. Now I will say that the correlation for severe weather for four through six kilometer storm relative winds, that's kind of weak. It hasn't been found to be all that useful. However, the zero through two kilometer winds, yeah, that does correlate strongly to severe weather. And the threshold for that is 15 knots, and that's what that white line is. So if the red bar is to the right of that white line, that's a good indicator of good inflow and enhanced potential for severe weather. And then finally, at the very top, we've got the 9 through 11 kilometer winds. It's very hard to see, but it's a purple vertical line. And I'm going to point to that with a cursor. And that indicates that the 9 through 11 kilometer layer storm relative winds are about 45 knots. So what does that mean? Well, there's a couple of bands here. I don't know if you can see that. There's a dashed purple line. That's a threshold between HP and classic supercells, assuming we can get supercells going. And then it's hard to see, but there's another dashed line right there on the edge at 70 knots. And that marks a boundary between classic supercells and LP supercells. So obviously, if that bar is off the scale way out here, if you can't see it and you, you can see strong winds aloft, that's a good indication that you're above 70 knots and into the LP range. So that's how we work at uh, the storm relative winds height diagram.
There are many different ways of forecasting. One method is to use the soundings and hodographs and the data that they provide. We have an interesting algorithm that gives us our most likely type of severe weather. This algorithm here is found on the very right. This is the probable hazard type. It's based on an analysis of past events. So it is climatology centered and it uses various combinations of CAPE, convective inhibition, shear, as predictors. And it's either an on or off state. If it matches a certain amount of CAPE, it forecasts the hazard type. If there isn't enough CAPE, then it does not forecast the hazard type. So that opens up a lot of room for error when the environment is close to those threshold values. So these weather occurrences are not forecast dynamically. It's simply going by a checklist. Here's a diagram showing all the possible hazard types, and we can see that it works from the most severe types, PDS tornado, tornado, marginal tornado, and then it looks for the others only if we don't have a match. So that way we're guaranteed not to miss the most problematic ones. And you can see that these are all determined by combinations of significant tornado parameter, storm out of felicity, bulk wind difference, and so on. We're not going to go into all those, but that's how it comes up with these values. So in closing, I'll say use with caution. Next, we have the thermodynamic data table. Fortunately, that's pretty cut and dry. And this panel quantifies some of the thermodynamic data on the SKU T. And there's a look at it. We've got different columns here. We've got CAPE, which is, of course, a measure of energy and instability. We have the convective inhibition the lifted condensation level, the lifted index, the level of free convection, and of course the equilibrium level. Now of course we can calculate each of those in many different ways. The simplest method is just lifting a parcel from the surface. And that gives us our surface-based method. Sometimes that's abbreviated SB. And we're just basically lifting from that level right there and figuring out all our quantities. The next method is mixed layer, ML, and that uses the lowest 100 millibars. The other method is forecast, where we attempt to forecast the afternoon temperature. This should not be used in the afternoon, but only on the morning sounding, or you will get unpredictable results. Next, we have the most unstable method, or MU, and that tries to find the most buoyant parcel in the vertical. It does tend to overestimate a lot of the quantities. Then of course down in the middle we've got a variety of different indices. So the old Showalter index for example is gone. We do have useful indices like Dcape. 1200 of course is uh, it's the threshold for damaging downbursts. We've got uh, precipitable water that gives an idea of your flooding potential, especially in weekly shared environments. And then we have expressions of lapse rates in different layers. Finally, we have the supercell composite index and various expressions of significant tornado parameter and significant hail index. And then we have the kinematic data panel. This gives us information relating to flow and motion in different layers of the atmosphere. And from that, we can get expressions of storm motion, SRH, and shear. Okay, let's look at what parameters we have available. On the top row, energy helicity index. This is a multiplicative index that uses CAPE and storm route of helicity. We also have the pure SRH itself that of course is dependent on the storm motion vector 
and for that we use the bunker's right motion vector. And then we have shear. That's the difference in wind between the top and the bottom of the layer in knots. Then we have the mean wind vector, and then the storm relative winds, and of course, and of course some of that is available in the storm relative wind diagram that we covered earlier. We can also evaluate that through a few different layers. One is the traditional surface through one kilometer layer, which is very important for tornado genesis. So that zero through one kilometer SRH, that's one of the key factors there. We also have the surface through three kilometer layer. During the 80s and 90s, that was thought to be a good predictor for rotating storms. However, there wasn't very good sampling of the zero through one kilometer layer at the time, either in the numerical models or in the radio sonde observations. So we've since transitioned to the surface through one kilometer layer. You can still look at that deeper layer, but since it's topped out at about 10,000 feet, that's usually going to be up within the cap, and it's not going to be representative of what the storm is ingesting. Now for what the storm is ingesting, the effective inflow layer is probably better than any of those values, because that's computed to be the buoyant layer, and that's going to be scaled accordingly with what the weather situation is doing. So perhaps that's probably the best measure to use of all of them. We also have our deep layer bulk shear. There's the traditional surface through six kilometer measure. So in this case, we've got 61 knots of bulk shear. We can also evaluate that through a deeper layer, higher up into the cloud near the anvil, and that's the surface through eight kilometer layer, topping out at about 28,000 feet or so. Also, we can base the layer at the LCL instead of the ground, and we call that the cloud layer. We can evaluate the shear the same way, and then we have the effective shear. The effective shear layer runs from the most unstable parcel height, wherever that is, up to the most unstable equilibrium level, so that can help account for the bias in tall storms, short storms, and kind of normalize a lot of those effects. So here we have the effective bulk wind difference. And that's used as a replacement for these fixed layer methods. We also have BRN shear, which is a divided quantity of shear in CAPE. We have the four through six kilometer storm relative wind, and of course that's given on the storm relative wind diagram. Then we have the storm motion vectors. The bunker's right motion, which corresponds usually to your most severe storms, and the left motion, which is what you're going to get in storm split situations with the left mover. Then we have the Corfiti down shear and up shear vectors. The down shear vector is used in forward propagating squall lines and the up shear vector is used in back building squall lines. And the Corfiti vector is meant to give you an estimate of storm motion, adding in the effects of propagation. And then right here we see a plot of the one and six kilometer winds, and this is ground relative. And it gives you a quick glance at the shear that's present in the environment. Next, we have SARS, and that's not a reference to the current pandemic. That's the sounding analog retrieval system. And that gives us a built-in analog forecasting system that uses prior severe weather events. The sounding analog inset is provided in the bottom part of the Sharpie diagram, right down here. And we can see it's divided into two columns, supercells, and significant hail. The supercell section is divided into tornado occurrences. We have significant tornadoes, which is uh, EF2 and up. We have weak tornadoes, which are the bottom end of the EF scale, and we have non-tornadic events. So we've seen a match with a diverse assortment of different storm modes. And we have a list here of dates. This is in two-digit year, month, date, and hour in UTC time, and the station that's referenced. Now you can see that these are not ordinary radio sound launch stations. 
That's because these are based on gridded model data. However, it does appear that there is some historical data included. And at the bottom, there's also a probability match indicating the likelihood of significant tornadoes. So this algorithm goes for a 56% chance. Similar setup with the hell side. However, this is based on actual radioson launches. And similarly, we get a, and we also get a probability of significant hail two inches and up, which is above golf ball sized, based on this analog forecasting algorithm. So what do you do with these event dates? Well, if you're on a workstation, you can click on them and pull up the historical sounding. On sites like Pivotal Weather, you can't really do anything with the data. However, it's for your information. If you have familiarity with these events, you can consider whether it's a similar setup and maybe go back and review past charts if there's time. And a quick look at how the algorithms work. Supercell SARS matches three different classes of supercell events, significant tornado, weak tornado, or non-tornado events. And it's based on almost a thousand proximity soundings. And it's based on grid and model data adjusted with surface data. And it's important to point out that the predictor at the bottom of the display forecasts EF3 and up. The hail SARS considers hail events with two inch or larger hail. And you can see it's based on over 1100 soundings between 1989 and 2006. They are observed soundings that are modified and there's certain criteria for them to be accepted. The supercell matching criteria looks like this. It has to match all of these. And for example, when it's comparing the LCL between a historical event and the current event, see on the second line right there, to be considered in the probability forecast, the LCLs have to be within 500 meters of each other. And there have to be matches for mixed layer cape, low level shear, low level SRH, lapse rate, and so on. Similar setup with hell, there have to be matches with most unstable cape, most unstable mixed layer, lapse rates, shear, and temperature at 500 millibars. It's important to point out that they found that freezing level, wet bulb zero, and zero through three kilometer SRH were poor predictors. So those were actually not used in the SARS algorithm. And finally, down there in the bottom right is the significant tornado parameter. And this panel takes prior situations with a broad range of tornado intensities and even an absence of tornadoes, and it shows where the current environment fits in. So significant tornado parameter, what is it? Well, it's a mixture of CAPE, which is instability, SRH, which is your curvature on the hodograph, bulk wind difference, the shear between the lower and upper levels, lifted condensation level, a measure of relative humidity in the lower levels, and convective inhibition, a measure of cap strength. Here's how the significant tornado parameter is constructed. We can see that this is a multiplicative index. So we're taking those five terms and we're just multiplying them against one another. And of course, before we do that, each individual component is corrected a little bit with a little coefficient or we're adding a little value to it. And that just kind of scales it so it fits in with the others once we do that multiplication. Since this index is not conditional like the probable hazard type, this index scales smoothly. And for the most part, you're going to get accurate results with this index in various weather regimes. Still though, it should be used with caution since it's based on assumptions and there's always outliers. Also, there can be bad sampling of the environment and unrepresentative proximity sounding, unusual storm structure, model failures, and stuff like that. So how does this work? Well, take for example, EF4 tornadoes. So EF4 and EF5. Of all the cases that they looked at, they had a median STP of about 
and about 50% of all cases fell between 2.7 and 8.2. And then the outliers span from about 1 to 11. And we can see that the value that we're at right now is represented by that brown line, and we're well below the criteria for the EF4 case. So it doesn't even fit the outliers. Now as we go to progressively weaker tornadic situations, we get more into those ranges. And once we go all the way down to EF0, we're right about at the median. And we can see that in terms of non-tornadic storms, we are actually in the outlier area. So based on this, we can see that we're about in the EF0 range, but we could see potentially anywhere from a non-tornadic event up to maybe EF2. Again, it's all probabilities, and, and it's a lot like playing the casinos in Vegas, of course. And then we have this inset. This shows all the contributors to significant tornado parameter by element. Now you'll notice that some of the rows have different colors like brown and yellow and so on. Here's an explanation. One important aspect is there are actually two different shades of brown. It can be kind of hard to pick that out. And these correspond to different ranges of CAPE, LCL, SRH, and so on. And I would use the color coding instead of the exact numbers to kind of key you in on what's going on. The parameters that are white, yellow, red, and so on, those indicate elevated values, and I would probably go back to the sounding and the photograph and take that as a signal to look at those elements closer. And that's my presentation of Sharpie. I hope you enjoyed that. I strongly recommend a book that I wrote a few years ago called The Instability, SKU-T, and Hodograph Handbook. It does provide a very detailed overview of Sharpie. There's a large section on that. There's probably more information on Sharpie in there than anywhere else. And of course, there's a ton of information in there about SKU-T's and Hodographs in general. And that's available at weathergraphics.com. Anyway, enough for that shameless advertising. I will go ahead and let you go. And feel free to catch our daily weathercasts, usually available on the weekdays, except on Monday. And take care, and we will see you next time.